I friggin' love Godzilla. So yeah, normally on this channel I tend to stick to animated reviews, particularly animations that happen to be a lot darker and weirder than your typical mainstream content. But my guilty pleasure outside the realms of animation has to be the Godzilla series. From the goofy Showa era, to the more serious Heisei era, and to the experimental millennial era. I love it all. Well, except for Godzilla's Revenge, that film can fuck right off. Godzilla says that I should learn to fight my own battles, you know. I would honestly like to do more reviews on the Godzilla series. I know a fair amount of you have requested Shin Godzilla, and I think Godzilla vs Destroyer being a darker entry could also work too. And then there's also the animated Godzilla series. So yeah, do let me know if that's something that you'd like to see in future reviews. But hey, it's 2021, and we're getting a cinema release of King Kong vs Godzilla which is a sentence I'd never thought I'd be able to say. Though not quite a cinema release, seen as how there's a worldwide pandemic going on, which is also a sentence I never thought I'd say. So of course I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to review another Godzilla film on my channel. And what better one to go for than the original King Kong vs Godzilla in 1962. Which yes, is everything you'd expect a 1960s monster movie to be, and so much more. Despite my love of this film now, however, when I originally watched this as a kid from way back in the day, I absolutely hated this film. And you'll see why. But first, a quick history. In 1954, we had the original Godzilla film, simply titled Godzilla. The film took itself very seriously and was much darker than your typical monster movie at the time feeling more like an apocalyptic horror rather than a sci-fi thriller. This was because Godzilla wasn't simply meant to be a giant monster, but more of a metaphor for nuclear destruction and the devastation it can cause. Something that Japan at the time was all too familiar with. I've done a more in-depth review on this in the past, so if you want to hear that in further details, go check out the link in the top right corner. Then in 1955 there was a sequel film, Godzilla Raids Again which was released a mere six months after the original. A new Godzilla is discovered along with a prehistoric monster called Anguirus, and the two end up duking it out. Despite coming out so soon after the original, the film already had a much different feel to it. Rather than trying to tell the story of nuclear destruction, it was more just a quick cash grab to milk Godzilla's success. And because of the rush production, the final product comes out as looking cheap, with incredibly bland characters and story. Godzilla manages to beat Anguirus, but is then buried in an avalanche of snow and ice. Which funnily enough, is quite a fitting ending, as after this film, Godzilla himself will go into hibernation for the next 7 years. Meanwhile over in America, Willis O'Brien, the stop motion animator for the original King Kong film, pitches a film idea to have Kong fight off against Frankenstein's monster. Without O'Brien's knowledge, the project was given to Toho to produce the film, who had always wanted to make a King Kong film of their own. Because Toho was approaching its 30th anniversary, they decided it would be more fitting and more marketable to have Godzilla take the place of Frankenstein's monster. And so, King Kong vs Godzilla went into production. Ishiro Honda returns to direct, who did the original Godzilla film, along with legendary composer Akira Ifukabe. Yep, I made sure to pronounce it correct this time, thank you guys. The film was going to be a landmark in monster fights, as not only would it be having two of the most iconic monsters squaring off against one another, but would also be their first appearance in colour. But despite both monsters being large at the box office, that wasn't quite the same for the monsters themselves. I mean on one hand you had the Chad Godzilla who stood at 50 meters tall and was able to deflect artillery and missiles as if they were nothing. Then on the other hand you had the Virgin Kong who was a measly 18 meters tall and got beat by three biplanes firing machine guns. So Kong was going to need a bit of a size buff to bring him to Godzilla's level, or else it wouldn't be much of a fight at all. But even then Godzilla still had other advantages, such as armoured skin, the ability to breathe underwater, 
and of course, the iconic Atomic Breath. So even with Kong's size increase, it was still going to be a pretty one-sided fight. So they also gave Kong some other buffs in the film, which uh, we'll talk about later on. Also, just a note, normally when it comes to foreign films, I try to watch the subbed versions over the dubbed, as I like to see them in how they were originally presented. But for the Godzilla films, I tend to favour the dubs, as one, this is how I remember watching them as a child, so it's far more nostalgic for me, and two, I just think some of the Godzilla dubs are hilarious. King Kong is my responsibility, and you have no right to destroy him, you dumbbell. Dumbbell? There are some differences between the two versions, but I'll talk about those as the review progresses. But for now, let's take a look at King Kong vs Godzilla, the original. As you'd expect in a Japanese film, the first scene we see is an American news reporter speaking to us in English. Yeah, so about some of those differences between the two versions. For the Western release, these American news reporting scenes were added in kind of similar to what they did with the US release of the original Godzilla film. These scenes don't really add much to the story, more just there as a commentary to spoon feed the plot for what was obviously happening on screen. The real plot of the film starts with workers from a pharmaceutical company. They've recently discovered some new berries from a remote island off the coast of Japan called Skull Island. Two miles south from there was a small island called Faroe Island. Oh, oh sorry, Faroe Island where there is also rumour of a giant monster living there. A giant monster? <laughs> he must be putting us on. Well, considering we're living in a universe where there's already been the discovery of two Godzillas and a prehistoric ankylosaur, I really don't think the idea of a fourth monster existing is all that far-fetched. The head of the company, Mr. Taco, is less interested in the berries and more interested in the giant monster and wants the creature to be captured and brought back to Japan to increase publicity for his company. Yeah, because that's how I decide which company I should go for for my medication. That's why I'm still on the fence about whether to go for the AstraZeneca or Visor vaccine. I mean, none have even attempted to endorse a giant monster. Who out there is watching our show? Nobody. Because it's dull and boring and without imagination, that's why. I imagine this is similar to the discussion Toho had after the flop of Godzilla raids again. Meanwhile, a nuclear submarine crashes into an iceberg which ends up freeing Godzilla. Thanks, America. All stations, report damage. What could we hit? It must be an iceberg. Iceberg? Yeah, I mean, what were the chances? Now in the Japanese version, this is where Godzilla had been trapped since Godzilla raids again. Though in the US version, it's said that he's been frozen there since prehistoric time. Which may sound dumb, because it is, but this was actually how they originally planned to reveal Godzilla in the 2014 film. Look there, Al. In the water. Ew, Godzilla Pierce. Japan sends out their strongest line of toy tanks to stop the monster, but to no avail. Yutaka Omura from Tokyo. Reporting that the situation is grim. I agree. So let's cut to our two boys from the pharmaceutical company to see how they're faring on Skull Faroe Island. Ah, oh, too bad. We forgot to bring candy. You better not smoke it around home. Ah yes, we come bearing gifts, hip hop music and cancer for your children. The piece doesn't last long, however, as they are soon attacked by a giant octopus. Uh, a lone female plus some giant octopus tentacles? I've seen enough internet to know where this is going. And uh, fun fact, this scene with the octopus attack was actually done with four octopuses, or octopi. The filmmakers would blow hot air onto them to make them squirm about. And after filming, three of the octopus were released back into the ocean, where one would later return to acting to play the role of Davy Jones's head in Pirates of the Caribbean, whilst the fourth one was kept and served up as dinner for the special effects director. How lovely. Back to the film, King Kong appears to battle the octopus, and holy shit. Yeah, King Kong really doesn't look great in this film. 
Not just from appearance, but also the way he moves about. Whereas I think Godzilla can still look convincing in suitmation as a lumbering dinosaur, Kong literally just looks like a guy in a gorilla costume. Much like that one episode of Spongebob. And on top of that, the close-ups of his face just look comically bad, as he just has this vacant, derpy expression which never changes. Hell, even the 1933 original version offered more expression than this. Which again, fun fact, the director of the original King Kong film, Marion C. Cooper, also really hated the Kong design for this film, stating in a letter, I was indignant when some Japanese company made a belittling thing to a creative mind, called King Kong vs Godzilla. I believe they even stooped so low as to use a man in a gorilla suit, which I have spoken out against so often in the early days of King Kong. And in 1963, he actually filed a lawsuit against the film, claiming he was the sole owner of Kong. I am. My company owns him. He didn't succeed. Kong manages to best the giant octopus, but is then knocked out after drinking a bunch of the berry juice. Oh god, it's just like how my dad would be on Friday evenings. And Saturday evenings. And Sunday evenings and Monday. Conveniently off screen, they manage to put Kong on a giant raft and are towing him back to Japan. The Japanese navy gets wind of this, and given their previous experience with giant monsters, aren't too keen on having Kong brought to Japan, and so have the raft destroyed, where Kong wakes up and swims to shore anyway. Meanwhile, after being absent for much of the film, Godzilla reappears and decides to take a stroll through the countryside. I beg your pardon, General Shinzo. But this is our latest report. Godzilla's nearing Hokkaido. Did did his voice actor dub just change mid-sentence? But this is our latest report. Godzilla's nearing Hokkaido. We once again get our ingenious train network that is notable throughout the Godzilla series, who despite having plenty of warning on Godzilla's presence, still have the goddamn trains running. Who I guess I should actually give credit towards, as in the UK there only needs to be a leaf on the train line and all the services grind to a halt. And of course, once they realise the danger, instead of throwing the train into reverse like a logical decision, they simply stop and abandon it, despite the fact that it could easily outrun the slow pacing Godzilla. Luckily however, Kong has arrived on the mainland, and begins marching his way towards Godzilla. Oh boy, here we go! It may have taken an hour into the film, but we're finally going to get some monster fighting. Who's going to win? The Mighty Kong or the Brutal Godzilla? This is exciting. This is intense. This is... Over? Yeah, so after taking a near blast from Godzilla's atomic breath, Kong very quickly decides, fuck this shit, and bids a hasty retreat. Though I can't really blame Kong for wanting to run away, it was a pretty anticlimactic engagement for their first meet, and considering we're an hour into the film, you can't help but feel disappointed. Oh, that Kong. He's chicken. The military carry on trying to stop Godzilla, but to no success. I mean, don't they know they're in a Godzilla film? What were they expecting? They figure out that Godzilla is weak to electricity, and manage to deter him away with some power lines, despite these having no effect on him in the original film. Oh gee, if I only had some sort of ranged attack to destroy this with. But what's even more bullshit is that they also discover that Kong coincidentally happens to gain energy from electricity. Which, yeah, this makes no sense whatsoever, and has never been established earlier in the film. But this all goes back to that original film concept of having Kong fight Frankenstein's monster. So it would have been Frankenstein's monster gaining strength from the electricity, which would make a lot more sense for the character. But then Godzilla replaced Frankenstein's monster, but that in turn would now make Kong the underdog. So the script was most likely changed to now put Kong in Frankenstein's original role, and Godzilla into Kong's, hence why it's Kong that can absorb the electricity. Confused much? Good, let's carry on. Where the military have now found a way to deter Godzilla, it's now Kong running around and causing a rampage amongst Japan. Oh, and there's that classic train running into danger scene. I like how in this scene, Kong does his classic simping, where he begins to show compassion to a random woman, but then also proceeds to throw down the train carriage, which is still containing dozens of innocent people. We then sort of get a recreation of the classic scene with Kong on the Empire State Building, 
but rather than shoot at Kong like in the original, they instead put him back to sleep by launching missiles with the berry juice that knocked him out before. And then we get what is one of the most ridiculous scenes in the film, where in order to transfer Kong to Godzilla, they hook him up to a bunch of helium balloons and send him off into the sky. Funnily enough though, despite the insanity of this scene, it still wouldn't go on to be the craziest sight we'd see in the Godzilla series. Kong is then dropped onto Godzilla, quite literally, and it is only now that we're finally going to get a proper fight between the two monsters, with less than 10 minutes remaining. Though this fight is short, it is actually pretty intense and damn hilarious to watch. Kong with his newfound electric powers can now put up more of a fight against Godzilla, sort of, and the two just go batshit against each other, with Kong launching boulders at Godzilla, Godzilla blasting Kong, Kong trying to shove a tree down Godzilla's throat, and even a weird stop motion shot of Godzilla drop kicking Kong down a hill. It's brilliant stuff. And of course, a lot of wild flailing into each other. Quality stuff. Kong once again begins losing the fight, but thanks to some bullshit plot convenience lightning, regains his strength and manages to turn the tide against Godzilla. Electricity makes him stronger? Uh huh. Yeah, I think that face says it all. And ironically, gaining strength from lightning will be a trait given to Godzilla later on in the series. Not gonna lie though, the final fight scenes are actually pretty intense, with the lightning strikes, the burning forest, and the standoff around the Atomi castle, which would actually go on to feature in multiple Godzilla films. The fight ends with both monsters tumbling down a cliff and plunging into the sea. For a while, there was no sign of either monster, until... Look! Kong is swimming safely out to sea. No Godzilla. Oh, fuck right off did Kong manage to beat Godzilla. Even with his size buff and electricity bullshit, Godzilla was still dominating the battle. And with Godzilla having the advantage in a water-based environment, the moment they plunged into the ocean, it should have been a GG for the derpy simping ape. And yeah, this is what really pissed me off as a kid when I first watched the film. And as a result, I refused to watch it again for years. I remember hearing the rumor that in the original Japanese version, it was actually Godzilla who won the fight. But once the internet came a thing, I soon found out that this really wasn't the case. As Kong still emerges victorious from the ocean, the only difference actually being is that you hear Godzilla's roar as Kong is swimming away. Now it does seem weird that Toho would allow their star monster to be beaten by Kong, but the reasons for it were that one, Godzilla was still considered a villain at this time, and two, even in Japan, Kong was considered the more popular of the two monsters. That to me though, is still not good enough, so I decided to create my own alternative ending to the film. We wish him luck on his long, long journey home. Despite my dismay at the outcome of the fight, King Kong vs Godzilla is a solid entry in the Godzilla series, and set a lot of standards for future films to come. It was the first film to shift the series to a much lighter tone, it gave Godzilla his blue atomic breath, it gave Godzilla his more iconic roar, but most importantly, it was the first to give the monster fights those truly spectacular and goofy throwdowns that would go on to defy the Showa era. Yes, the film's plot is stupid and certain scenes are downright ridiculous, but at the same time, it's also kind of intentional, as the film's ridiculous plot is actually meant to be a satirical joke on the Japanese television industry, where at the time, various companies would be doing all sorts of crazy stunts in order to capture the public's attention. This approach also gives us something that is incredibly rare for the Godzilla series, and that's entertaining human characters. 
giving them exaggerated actions and traits, which could almost be considered a personality. Yes, yes it is, Doctor. That's ridiculous. In case, let us pray. I, I, I don't believe in superstition. You pray. I think Godzilla's design for this movie is actually pretty cool. He has more of a dinosaur look than in the other films, with a longer mouth, sharper claws, and yellow eyes. Kong, on the other hand, yeah, not so much. If I was going to have one major critique of this film, it's that despite being called King Kong vs Godzilla, there is very little fighting between the two monsters, only around 10 minutes to be precise. And because of this, the middle portion of the film does tend to drag a bit, and we get this side plot of having to rescue the woman from Kong, which honestly could have just been cut out. But once the action does get going, it's great stuff. Right now I'm feeling pretty hyped for the Kong vs Godzilla 2021 film, and hope that like the original, it just embraces the absurd setting and just goes full nuts with the plot. It's almost a shame the film couldn't have come out next year, as it would have marked the 60th anniversary from the original film. It will be interesting as to how the fight is handled this time round, as Godzilla is not a straight up villain anymore, and he's arguably now the more popular character. So if they do him dirty again like in the original, I can't say I'm going to be too happy about that. But yeah, I recommend going to check out the original Kong vs Godzilla if you haven't already. There's a lot of fun to be had, and rather than being a grumpy old cynic pointing out the obvious flaws in the film, <coughs> you're better off just sitting back and going along with the madness. While Kong is a thinking animal, his brain is considerably larger. <laughs>